Let's begin with creation. You know, the most common question people ask about, um, about the creation accounts in Genesis is, is this true? I mean, surely it's just stories that have been kind of made up. I would say, yes, I believe it is a true account of creation in that I believe that God, the Holy Spirit, inspired the, the writer, who's traditionally Moses, um, and gave him a, a true account of creation as much as could be understood by someone of his time. So it's a, it's a true account, but within the limitations of understanding there. You see, even our understanding now, even, even scientists these days, um, only know a little bit of the, um, how the universe came into being. They only have a little bit of discovered knowledge. Most of it is, is ignorance. So, you know, whatever we can understand has always got to be within the limit of what we can comprehend. Also, um, the accounts of creation in Genesis um, are written as, uh, as poetic accounts. They're not written as, um, you know, scientific, literal accounts. And you can see that in the language. If you heard it in the Hebrew, um, you'd really understand that this was written as, as poetry to be, you know, the richness of the language. But even in an English translation, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness brooded upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, and God spake and said, let there be light, and there was light. And you can see that even in the English translation, you can feel that, you know, this is, is poetry. So the whole use of language is, is, is poetic. And uh, the one which is most argued about is the, you know, the six days of creation, you know, was six days, literally six periods of 24 hours. Well, the word which is yom in, in Hebrew um, does, not, does not need to mean literally 24 hours. Um, it can be used in, in the way that we sometimes use the English word. You know, we might say, you know, Tony Blair had his day. What we mean is he had, he had a time of, of power and popularity, and that's gone. Um, we don't mean it was one day. He had 24 hours when he was in control, and then that was it. We don't mean that. So often, the use of the word term day um, actually means a, an unspecified time. So we do not need, as the, the, um, you know, the sort of creationist, fundamentalist Christians do, to argue with science and say, oh no, no, it's got to be six periods of 24 hours. There's, there's no need for that. Because um, almost all the scholars in Hebrew would say, that isn't what it is supposed to mean. What is remarkable when you look at it is actually how much it affirms of what science knows. The first two things that are mentioned in creation is light and water, things that are most sort of central, we now know, to, to life. And the whole order of creation, beginning with, with vegetation and then animal life, beginning in the sea, and then later on the land, and developing into humankind, all of that is remarkably uh, in tune, really, with modern science. And so to me it seems that this isn't sort of mere guesswork, making up a story, but this is something which is um, an inspirational account of, of creation, a revelation. Okay, let's leave behind creation and uh, let's look at Abraham, from whom the whole um, of the, the Jewish nation and religion descends. Now these days, if a, if a farmer came in with being with his livestock all day and he came in and said that he'd started to hear voices, people would get very worried. But actually in Abraham's day, there was nothing remarkable about that. 
for a start, you know, the world over, actually this is still true the world over, people didn't feel that they were the biggest thing in the universe. People actually thought that the universe had, had um, you know, life bigger and beyond them. And also people had much more an ability to listen, to hear the voice of creation speak, to hear uh, an inner voice, to feel a spiritual presence. This was a common thing, not just to Abraham. What was really unusual about Abraham was that he doesn't kind of, from having this spiritual encounter, start to fill in the blanks. The common thing was to think, oh my goodness, I, I think I've... I've encountered some kind of spirit, some kind of God. Um, so we've got to give it a name. It should have a name. And, and, and what's it got of? Maybe it's a God of this wood, or of this river, or a God of this mountain. So when it's got a place and a name, and then you start thinking, well, perhaps it's got a purpose. Perhaps it's a God particularly for this, or particularly for that. And, and then, of course, you'd, you'd build an altar and maybe a temple, and it would all turn into into worship, and you get organised religion. Of course, that happened all over the place. And um, in the, um, in, in the, the more developed civilizations like Egypt in Abraham's time, and Greece later, this developed into an incredibly complicated system with so many different gods and names and purposes and stories of how they all interrelated. But Abraham resists any of that. For Abraham, it is just a personal encounter with God that slowly develops over the years. And he doesn't fit in any blanks. God doesn't have a name or a story. God is just simply an inner voice which Abraham comes to trust and it leads him. It's very, very simple. And out of this relationship and trust develops the covenant. And to begin with, the covenant is simply a promise to Abraham of two things. And they're the two things he most desires. One is um, descendants. Because although he's the head of a community that could be, you know, two, three, four hundred people, moving around, don't forget, they're nomads with all their livestock. But he and Sarah, his wife, don't have any children. He doesn't have a son. So the first promise is probably the number one in, in his heart, that he's going to have a son and descendants. The second one is probably the number two. It's the promise of land. You know, it's, it's good that this is Plough Sunday because reintroducing Plough Sunday really sort of reinforces how important it is in the Bible. This relationship that we have with the land, that, you know, we belong to the land, that we look after the land, and then the land looks after us. And that's true in so much of the Bible. We see how important that relationship is, and, uh, and the, the blessing of, of the plough and the work of the land being so important for our community. Abraham knew this because he didn't have anywhere where he belonged. He didn't have a home. He had to wander continually. The thing that he loved and that God promised was one day your descendants will have their own land, the place where they will belong, where they can put down roots, a land for them to care for and a land that will care for them because he didn't have it. So he starts this, this covenant, this relationship with God, this promise, and it's passed on to his son, to Isaac, and then Isaac has two sons, and this is a problem for Isaac, because he's imagining that this, this, this covenant, this promise, can only go to one of his sons, the firstborn, as though you were sort of passing on an estate or a king passing on a crown. And that means that Jacob, the second son, who's the one who's actually really interested in this covenant, has to kind of cheat his way into it and you get that wonderful story of him um, running away in the middle of the night and he's running away from all the colossal wealth now, a huge amount of livestock and a big community that his father Isaac has and he runs away with nothing except a handful of words 
the words of his elder brother um, saying, OK, you can have my birthright as long as you give me some stew, you know, the mess of pottage. And the words of his elderly father blessing him, believing that he's the firstborn. But you know, what's remarkable is for Jacob, those words are more important than all the rest. Because that means that the covenant, this unseen relationship with, with this God without name, is his. And so it's through Jacob that we have, you know, the 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And for Jacob, it's not the firstborn that inherits, it's all of them. He says, no, you all get it. The covenant is for all of you. But rather like Jacob and Esau, they're not all e equally interested in this covenant, in this relationship with an unnamed God. The openness is kind of different for each one. It's Joseph who's really open to the things of God. And it's through Joseph that uh, they're rescued out of famine and they go down to Egypt. But then as the years go on and you get a, a new regime in Egypt and the Egyptians turn on the Hebrews as these outsiders and they make them a slave race to do their bidding. And it's through those years of slavery that Israel really bound together through the hardship that they shared. And then at the end of uh, today's session, Moses comes and he's given this impossible task. Right, you've got to convince Pharaoh to let the Hebrews, let the Israelites go free. And, uh, and Moses' big problem is that God doesn't have a name. He says, but, but if I go to the, Egypt and the Egyptians and say, you know, I've met with God in the desert, and he says you've got to let his people go free, they're going to say, what God? I mean, all gods have a name and a purpose and loads of backstory. What am I going to say? And God almost reluctantly gives Moses a name. But it's, it's more a kind of statement of being than a name. He says, you can say to Pharaoh that I am Yahweh in Hebrew. Literally means I am the name of God has sent me. And theologians would interpret that to being, you know, I am the source of all, of all being, the, the grounds of all life. You know, I am being that. And so, Moses leads them out of slavery into the desert. And at this moment, they're given the second sign of the covenant. The first sign came through Abraham, which is the physical sign of circumcision. This sign is a meal. It's the Passover meal. It's the meal that, of course, they still use to celebrate that moment when they are set free. Now they have become a nation fulfilling the promise of the covenant to Abraham. And they've been set free by God. The Passover is their, their meal of deliverance and freedom. And they go into the desert. And in the desert, they will encounter God. And the covenant which starts off as a one-way covenant, a unilateral covenant, where God just promises them and that's it. And it's going to become a bilateral covenant, which is a, a kind of a bargain, a solemn binding agreement where there's two sides. There's the promises of God on one side, and on the other side, there will be the promises of Israel that they have to fulfill, that they have to follow the ways of God. How do they know what they are? How do they know what is wrong and right in the eyes of God? Well, that's next week when Karen will be doing the session and they're given the Lord.